Are you a policymaker? Are you looking for new solutions in your region? Are you interested in learning from other European regions facing similar challenges? With Interreg Europe you can develop your interregional cooperation project and get co-financing from the European Union. You can team up with other regions in Europe, exchange your experience and improve your regional development policies. At Interreg Europe we help regions from across Europe mm -hmm. to develop and deliver better policies by sharing solutions. You can work on any topic of the EU policy agenda by making Europe greener, smarter, more social, better connected, better governed, or closer to citizens. Our first call of project proposals will open on the 5th of April and close on the 31st of May. At midday, hurry up and get ready to submit your application. Hello. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Q&A session, our third Q&A session. For those of you joining us today for the first time, we've been organizing these sessions from mid-April every two weeks to help you prepare your applications. My name is Charo, and I will be the moderator today. And answering your questions live, I have my colleagues Hasan and Alexandra here with me today. Hello, Hasan. Hello, Alexandra. Good morning, everyone. Behind, hey, behind the cameras, I have also my colleagues Petra and Josephine helping us out with all the technicalities and the chat. We will be sharing useful links and information with you. We invite you to go there and say hello, where you're connecting from. But please, for your question, for posting your questions, we, uh, we would appreciate if you can do it through Slido. You can connect to Slido through the, quote, the code that you will see on your screens right now, and also through this hashtag, first call questions. And we will be sharing the link with you also in the chat as I mentioned before. We will be running this session for about an hour, although we may stay a bit longer with you. If you keep asking questions, we will try to answer them uh, live, all of them uh, today, but uh, you're about 100 registered participants today. So if we couldn't manage to do so, please keep in mind that we will have another Q&A session coming on the 20th of May. So you will still have another opportunity to raise your questions and doubts to us. So um, I think that uh, we're all set. But before we start answering your questions, we would like to get to know you, our audience, today a little bit more. So we will launch the first call, the, the first poll of the day, sorry, to know how familiar you are with our program. So we invite you to answer, yes, I've taken part in an Interact pro, uh, Europe project before. Somewhat, I've applied with the project before, but was not successful or not really. You're not that familiar. You've heard uh, about us but you're here to know more about the program. So now we will give you a few uh, seconds to answer these questions. I will take the opportunity to remind you that we've been organizing these sessions uh, from a while now, but you still have another opportunity in two weeks if we could manage to answer all your questions today uh, on the 20th of May. This will be the last chance though, it will be our last session uh, to answer your questions live. So uh, let's see if we can have your answers on screen now. Oh, so we have a lot of newcomers today with us. Uh, almost half of you, 52% are not uh, so familiar with us. And 44%, yes, you've taken part in our project. So we can have an interesting mix of questions today. And I think uh, we're ready now, colleagues. We, if you're okay with it, we can start with the questions. And we have this question from Anna. Um, she would like to know if they can contract a staff uh, uh, specifically for the project and of course to cover this staff with the project budget. Alexandra, I think this one's for you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, um, this answer, this question uh, is pretty straightforward and the answer is also straightforward. Uh, yes, you can contract people uh, specifically for the project if you don't have um, staff that could uh, take part in project activities, you can uh, contract uh, staff for uh, implementing the project. Okay. 
then we can continue with the rest of the questions that we received in advance uh, for this session. We have uh, Jessica asking, is it appropriate to have three partners from the same geographical area, for example, three partners from West, uh, Western Europe, assuming that all eligibility criteria are met and that all other geographical areas are well represented? Hassan, I think this goes for you. Yes, uh, thank you, Jessica, for this question. In principle, it's possible. Um, it's true that the partnership might be a little bit unbalanced in terms of the four geographical areas. You need also to be careful because usually we look at the level of development of the regions. And usually the, the countries uh, from the West area, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, France, uh, Ireland, there might be regions that are more developed. So this you need also to take into consideration when you look at the uh, whole partnership, but in principle it's possible. So you're saying there that considering that there is a balanced budget, that uh, these regions or a group of regions do not, do not come from a, a existing cross-border or transnational area, and that the mix between more and less developed regions is uh, ensured, in principle, why not? And uh, Jessica also submitted another question. Uh, she says, it is considered strategic to involve from two, par two partners from the same region who are not the managing authority, both with different re relevant roles and potential to influence the policy instrument and to have the managing authority as an associated partner. Um, yes, this is possible, but it's not a strategic. For us, the strategic is to have the policy responsible authority as partner. So uh, this is the best case scenario. Uh, when you have, uh, in addition, when you cannot have the policy responsible authority as partner, and they are involved as uh, associated policy authority, they are a stakeholder at the end of the day. And what is important for you to keep in mind is that the partners that are involved they need to demonstrate their policy relevance. So it's not only because there is a declaration from the associated policy authority that we will not check that the partner that uh, uh, comes together with the associated policy authority is the right organization to be involved in an interreg Europe uh, project. Because at the end of the day, uh, this organization has to demonstrate in the application that they have the capacity to influence the policy instrument address and that they are involved in the decision making process that it relates to these policy instruments. Sometimes it's already difficult with one organization. If you have two, this adds a, a layer of complexity. So for us, it's not the best possibility. The best is always to have the policy responsible authority as partner in some cases, together with another organization uh, from the region. But two partner organiz two organizations uh, with no policy responsible authority, this is possible, but both of them, both will need to clearly demonstrate their policy relevance for the policy instrument address. Yeah, Hassan, I will take the opportunity to remind all our, our participants today that at the end of the day, the most important for us is that you are able to improve uh, the regional policy instruments that you are addressing in the project. So that is why it's so important that the managing authorities, the owners of these policies are involved in the project to uh, ensure the success, your success, and that you can improve these policy instruments. Okay, let's continue with Stefano. Can you explain if the partner must be only? Oh, sorry. Can you can you explain if the partner must be only from region from one region, which? Uh, oh, sorry. It's geographically confined. I'm not so sure what Stephanie Stefano was trying to to ask us here. Um, uh, yes, I'm sorry, Stefano, but me, I, I, it's not fully clear for me what your question is about. What do you mean by confinant or? Uh, why you mentioned that uh, the partner must be only from one region, geographically confined. Maybe you can send the question again mm -hmm. and it will be more clear to us. Uh, maybe you meaning that the partners from uh, cross-border areas. Um, maybe he's referring to the outermost regions, but I, I'm not so sure either. So, yeah, Stefano, we invite you yes. to post your question again, if you don't mind, so we can answer it. Uh, properly. Um, okay, let's continue with Ivan. Is it possible to target two policy instruments in exceptional cases? 
for example, a city targeting both the operational mm -hmm. program and a most local uh, city level strategy? Well, usually what we say is that you should focus on one policy instrument per region. It's already difficult to achieve policy change with one policy instrument. So in the application form per region, you will have to select only one policy instrument. Mm -hmm. This is the, this is, uh, the way to, to build the application. This does not mean that then in the course of the implementation of the project, uh, you can influence uh, because of the change of experience other other instruments, and we will be happy to uh, to know about this in the in the reporting. But for the application, uh, you should focus on one policy instrument per region, and this should be the policy instrument that you have more chances to influence, and also the one that better reflects the issue addressed by the by the project. Uh, Hassan Stefano actually posted a question again, and as you mentioned before, he referred to cross-border regions. He is saying, ah, that, yes, yeah. So what we usually say is that we we uh, Interreg Europe is a program that covers the twenty uh, all the European Union uh, member states. Uh, so. Uh, mm -hmm. 27 member states plus mm. Norway and Switzerland. So what we look in the partnership is a broad geographical coverage. You need to go beyond cross-border and transnational cooperation areas. Because if you come from with regions from a cross-border area, we will tell you that this is not the program from you for you, that you should apply to the to your cross-border ETC program. So uh, in some cases, you might come with two regions that come from a cross-border area, but only if it's two regions and you need to explain why they are relevant for the partnership. But in principle, you should go beyond always cross-border and transnational cooperation areas to ensure that the quality of the partnership, um, it's okay uh, when we will do the strategic assessment. Okay, Hassan, we have another question for you from Ivan. Uh, he is asking if the advisory partners count towards the when, when we consider the geographical coverage of a partnership. Uh, yes, it does. It counts for the uh, geographical coverage and for the eligibility criteria that you need to have partners from the four areas. So yes, it's a partner even though they do not address a policy instrument, they are a full partner that provides support to the rest of the, of the partnership. And we count them when we check the, uh, the eligibility criterion that uh, you need to involve uh, at least one partner from each geographical area of the program. And also Ivan has another two questions uh, related to good practices. Uh, He's asking us is if these pra good practices have to be uh, strictly related to policy issues, and if these good practices can come from third parties. So I think this one is also for you. Yes, uh, well, of course, they have to be related to policy issues. For us, the, the definition of good practice is that it derives from public intervention. So it has to come from a, from a program, a strategy, a, an initiative that has been launched in a territory uh, by public authorities that are part of the regional development policy and that they have proven uh, that they have been successful. This is the basis of the exchange of experience. So uh, this is very important to, for you to keep in mind. The good practices really need to derive from regional development policies, public intervention. Most of the, of the good practices should come from the partner regions. This is what we are uh, learning from uh, when we uh, develop the project activities from the experiences that our partners have been implemented in the, in the, in the past uh, years. It's true that in some cases, some partners might come or even the advisory partner can can also bring to the cooperation some good practices that do not come strictly from the, from the participating regions, but this should not be the main, uh, um, the main let's say, uh, knowledge that uh, comes, it's, is brought to the, to the cooperation. Most of the good practices need to be, come from the partner regions. And yes, if it's plain, some of them might come uh, from outside the, the partnership uh, area, but always related to regional development policies. Uh, in any case, I, I, I don't, it's, it's, it's in, the, in the definition of what a good practice is that you can check by the way in the draft program manual. 
And now we have one for Alexandra. Uh, Anna is asking whether, whether project management services can be subcontracted. Is, if yes, can these services be provided by an SME, a private company? Uh, so uh, yes, um, if, the, if the lead partner because, uh, or another partner does, don't have uh, internal resources to manage the project, yes, they can subcontract the project ma project management services and yes the, this can be a, a normal sme providing these services what needs to be remembered is that all applicable eu um, national and in uh, and internal public procurement rules must be respected uh, when procuring uh, these services and um uh even if um uh, if you are uh, if the services are below if the amount is below the uh, the your thresholds um you need to ensure a very transparent uh, non discriminatory procedure uh, i saw when you were switching uh when we saw all the questions there on the list i saw that there was a next question about uh, project management also whether um um other partners can also uh hire the external project coordination uh, coordinator and financial manager uh we have i haven't seen this uh normally if this is a service to be provided for the entire project uh normally this is the lead partner who is hiring uh, the services of uh, the external project coordinator or financial manager uh because i'm not sure how this would function if the lead partner is the one responsible for the overall project coordination uh, uh it would be surprising to see a regular project partner uh contracting the services of the overall project coordination um i don't know maybe you have a specific situation in mind in, if yes please get in touch with us, but we haven't seen it, uh, at least I haven't seen it yet in our uh, projects, and we would be really surprised to see it, and I don't know how this could be justified. And Alexandra, I think we have another question from you coming from Anna. She is asking if, if um, sorry, I had the question here and suddenly this moved and I lost the I question. have already answered that but, one. Uh, the one about the if another person from uh, exactly okay, if another partner yes yes because okay exactly well, then, this was the one <laughs> okay sorry uh Hassan, we had a very interesting question for you now that we are in this uh, transition period going from one programming period to another from federico is asking if uh they can address policy instruments that do not exist at the moment of the application uh, Federico, this is a very interesting question. The, the, the answer is uh, no, you cannot work on something that does not exist yet, because in the application form you will see that you need to provide details about the policy instrument that you plan to improve, uh, the, 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 how this policy instrument uh, is connected to the, to the uh, territorial context, to the issue address, so uh, it's not possible to address something that is still not uh, not uh, operational, let's say. There is this recurring question about the new generation of operational programs. Uh, there is people asking us, can we address the new operational program for 2021-2027? We say yes, as because we know that the operational programs are quite advanced in their uh, design. Uh, some of them are going to be very soon approved by the European Commission. And in this case, uh, because there is this requirement in addition to include one investment for jobs and growth goal program, it will be possible to uh, include the new uh, generation of operational programs, but this is because they are uh, more or less uh, designed um, in your case, in your region, because you need to define a policy instrument at the application stage, it will not be possible to, uh, to go for this option. Okay, and uh, another one for you, Hassan from Alicia. She's asking, I, I, what I understand is, if the advisory partner uh, can help the whole consortium or only one specific partner? 
Uh, yes, Alicia, this is also a very interesting question. The advisory partner, its role is to support the whole partnership because they have a specific skill or competence in communication or uh, financial management or because they are experts in the issue addressed by the project. So they are there to support the full partnership. If you check the draft program manual, there is a clear distinction between what is the role of an external expert and an advisory partner. The external expert is there to support uh, a particular uh, partner or a specific moment in the, in the project implementation. Uh, but the advisory partner, the role is really uh, to support uh, all the partners involved in the project. And also we have another question for you, Hassan, coming from Magali, uh, which is something actually that they ask, uh, they ask us very often and is the fact that if, uh, if the same partner can address two different policy instruments in the project. In this case, she's saying two partners from the same region join the project, one as partner, one as associated policy authority. The associated policy authority is managing authority for both policy instruments. Can this be a possibility? Uh, we answered this question a little bit earlier, and the answer is no. They should focus on one policy instrument, and then uh, you will need to decide, okay, the associated policy authority is uh, responsible for two policy instruments, but maybe the partner that will be involved in the project uh, is only relevant for one of them. So you again need to think about what is the policy instrument that I want to improve, how the issue address is reflected in this policy instrument, um, and what is the role of the, because you don't have the, the, the responsible organization as partner, it's only as, as an associated policy authority, what is the capacity of the partner to influence this policy instrument? So this will help you in selecting which is the most appropriate policy instrument to put in your application form. And again, it's one policy instrument per region. And Magali is also asking related to policy instruments, when uh, the stakeholders for the policy instruments that they are addressing in the project are a bunch of municipalities, she's asking if when drafting the application form, they can include uh, the group of municipalities as one stakeholders or one specific municipality, one that is maybe uh, more relevant for the policy instrument that they are addressing. Uh, you will see when you fill in the application form, the stakeholders, you need to include them one by one with the name of the organization. So you will need to include the, the, the municipalities that are more relevant uh, according to the policy instruments selected uh, for the stakeholder group. Uh, but again, you know, the stakeholder group is just an indicative list of organization. The fact that you put in the application form five municipalities doesn't mean that if the project is uh, approved, uh, you will be able to involve uh, more than five. Uh, so do not worry too much about this. Uh, you need to put maybe the four, five, two, three most relevant municipalities for the policy instrument address. And then later on, you will be able to involve other municipalities or other organizations that uh, the partners uh, might consider uh, relevant for the exchange of experience process. Yeah, actually the composition of the stakeholder groups is, is, is flexible. It's through God, the project lifetime, they realize that it can be a large because this will benefit the, the, the improvement of the policy instrument. They can do it actually. Uh, and we have uh, another question from Alicia as well. She's asking if uh, two partners from the same region uh, and addressing the same policy instrument can participate, but now she's specifying regional authority, not as associated partner with own budget and a public, I suppose, company or NGO. Uh, yes, this is uh, possible. Uh, the important thing here is that you involve the, the policy responsible authority as partner, and then together with them, you can have another uh, organization in the region that is relevant for the policy making process and that supports the policy responsible authority in the exchange of experience uh, process of the project. Uh, so two partners per region addressing the same policy instrument. Uh, this, is a, this is a possibility. In fact, if you check the program manual size of the partnership, we always say that the, let's say the average and the adequate uh, size of a partnership is between five and eight 
regions, so five and eight policy instruments, which means between five and 16 partners. So in principle, every region could have two partners. In some cases, this is rather exceptional. We don't see it very often. You could even have three. Imagine that you have the policy responsible authority together with the regional development agency and a, and a non-profit organization. And you have the three partners. There, you will need to just uh, pay attention to the budget allocation. So the budget for the region is balanced compared to the other uh, regions um, that uh, because you have the policy responsible authority, it would not be that important to demonstrate the policy relevance of the other two partners. And also what we say is that the bigger the partnership, the more complex it is to manage it. So if you don't have a lot of experience in managing uh, uh, this type of uh, European uh, territorial cooperation uh, projects is better to keep the size of the partnership uh, limited. But yes, in principle, it would be possible to have two partners from the same region addressing the same policy instrument, in particular if one of them is the policy responsible authority. Linking to the question that I received before, you have two organizations, you don't have the policy responsible authority. This is a little bit more delicate because for both of the organizations, we will really go into the detail and assess and check that these organizations, both of them are relevant in the policy making process and that they can really influence and that they are part of the decision making of the policy instrument that they address in the region. And to continue with uh, Alicia, Hassan, uh, and I think that you can use this question to explain a little bit the rationale of pilot actions, maybe for the newcomers. She's asking if a pilot action, if they can submit a pilot action in different regions under different conditions. Um, yes, I think that Alicia would you mean is that it's the same pilot action that it will be tested in different regions. Uh, so this complies with uh, the requirement that the pilots are uh, implemented jointly. You, you need at least two countries, uh, two, uh, two uh, countries to participate in a pilot. Um, so what can happen is that uh, you have discovered a nice uh, good practice that you would like to test in all the regions or a few regions in the partnership and that when you design the, the, the activities, the testing is not exactly the same in all the regions because you know some regions would like to focus in specific aspects, other regions would like only to test a, 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 another element of the pilot. At the end of the day, what is very important to keep in mind is that pilots are testing activities but that have the objective to improve the policy instrument address. So they have to be relevant for the policy instrument address. And if you are testing in the different regions, you will need to demonstrate in the application form how if this pilot is, is successful in the different regions, the partners will be able to introduce it in the policy instrument and uh, generalize the, 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 the testing uh, through uh, the, 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 the instrument address. But yes, this is, this is possible. What we recommend is that don't, we, because you know, pilots are a little bit complex to demonstrate the relevance. You can check what is the criteria that you need to fulfill to, uh, to get the pilot uh, approved by the program. Uh, if you go for a very complex pilot action with many, many regions testing, where the testing is completely different from one region to the next, uh, this adds again a, a layer of complexity that uh, if you are not very clear in what you write in the application form, it might raise questions and it might um, make the assessor put in question uh, the whole rationale of the pilot. So for pilots, keep it simple, straightforward, and, uh, and yes, in principle, you could do the same pilot and test it in, in different participating regions of the project. Okay, and now, Hassan, I will give you a break, and I have a question for Alexandra. Anna Sofia is asking Alexandra if they can hire researchers, and how do we see this? Um, this is also somehow related to the program rational. Uh, um, what we the the program what the program is uh, what the program 
is working towards is the exchange of experience. Uh, uh, so uh, we would need to, the, the, the type of contract is not as important as the role of this person in the project. Uh, so what we are looking for is uh, partners and staff from the partners exchanging experience and working together on a common uh, topic uh, towards uh, improving the policies. Um, I don't know if hiring researchers would be the proper way of improving policy. Uh, this is a proper way that we would like our uh, projects and project partners to work. Hassan can complete on that uh, later on. He can surely say uh, more on the project, uh, on the program rational. Um, the type of contract uh, itself that uh, the partners are using, uh, if you have doubts on the type of contract, uh, this is uh, very much uh, a national issue. Uh, we are here at Interreg Europe, we are unable to tell you if this or that type of contract would be um, uh, would be accepted uh, and eligible in uh, in our uh, in our program. Normally, if there is a cash flow between the institution and the employee, this person can be uh, can be um, the cost for this person can be planned in the budget under staff, and then. Uh, um, and then can be reported under staff uh, staff cost uh, category. Uh, but if you are unsure if this contract would be accepted, if there are some particularities in this contract that make you unsure, we invite you to contact your uh, national point of contact. We'll be able to uh, tell you more about it. And they will certainly get in touch with us if they think that there is something that needs our attention uh, and we will be discussing it uh, with them and with you uh, together. Yeah, let's say that from the finance uh, point of view, it wouldn't be a problem if they hire a researcher as such. But of course, they have to see if this fits into the uh, overall approach that they have and that how this is going to contribute to the improvement of the policy instruments. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Hassan, I don't know. I saw that you lowered your microphone. I don't know if you want. Yes. To... Well, it's just to 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 also complement what uh, Ola just mentioned that uh, Interreg Europe, we, in principle, we don't we don't finance research. We are not a research program. We are a program that is based on existing knowledge. So good practices that, as I mentioned before, have evidence of success uh, from the participating regions. Now in the programs, at the end of the day, we also have uh, universities uh, or research and technology centers that are also important actors in the ecosystem of the, of the different uh, regions. Oh, we lost Hassan. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I think we lost connection, but I suppose, well, he was trying to complement what we said before, that uh, of course, uh, if in the framework of the project and the activities that they are trying to uh, uh, carry out and the improvements, uh, the policy improvements that they are trying to achieve, uh, these organizations or these research centers as he, uh, technology centers, as he was saying, uh, make sense then why not? They can, of course, be Sorry. involved. But I'm, I'm back. I was kicked out from the session. I don't know why. Um, but we cannot see you, Hassan. We can ah. hear you, but we cannot see you. Ah, but I I, uh, I see myself in the screen. You cannot see me? And, uh, now we can. Ah, OK, OK. Well, Sorry. Like, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Sorry for this, uh, uh, okay. but yes, uh, no. So yes, this is mainly what I wanted to say. I'm sorry that I was uh, I was kicked out of the session. I hope no. it was not by a university. <laughs> I hope it doesn't happen again because no, we have but, but, but again, just to finish that we have universities as partners because sometimes universities are play an important role. They provide technical assistance or they are a consultation body for the for the policy responsible organizations. They do assessment of application of calls for proposals. They do uh, um, they do important uh, work in the in the and policy making process. Hassan, but, if, if 
If yes. I may, they usually they are advisory partners as well. Yes, they can be advisory partners because they have a, a, a good competence in the theme addressed by the by the project, and in this sense, uh, they they. But we always tell the the potential applicants be careful because we don't finance research. We are not a research program, and uh, the the involvement of researcher, as as Ola was saying has to be very well justified in the application form. Okay, um, has, uh, you, you, you completed your, the, the answer that you wanted to, to give, yes, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, because then we can continue with Beatriz. And she's, this also for you, Hassan. Uh, she's having a question about this 50% uh, threshold of, uh, she's saying public administration, I think she meant the managing authorities of the policy instruments uh, addressed, and she wanted to, uh, uh, to confirm if this applies at consortium level or it's per region, per partner. Uh, yes, Beatriz, this is uh, also a very interesting question that we get very often. Usually the 50% is policy instruments. So you have a project with uh, six policy instruments, three of them need to involve the policy responsible authority. Now, when you talk about public administration, it's true that in most of the cases, 90% of the cases, is a public uh, authority the responsible for the policy instrument. But there might be cases where it's not a public authority. There might be cases where it's a... a um, I don't know, we, we had examples of organizations that they have been delegated the responsibility to design or to implement a specific part of a policy. Uh, so uh, most of the cases is, is public authorities, but not 100%. In any case, to answer your question, the 50% is of the policy instruments addressing the project. So coming back to the questions that we had before, you might have one, uh, partnership with uh, six policy instruments and in every uh, region there are two partners so we have a partnership with 12 partners and let's put an advisory partner so we have 13 partners for the six policy instruments you need at least and the 12 partners that for six of them you have the policy responsible authority as partners so six out of the 12 should be involved in the project to comply with the eligibility rule that for 50% of the policy instruments, you need the policy responsible authority involved as partner. I hope that uh, I was clear with the answer. And we have a very interesting question, uh, Hassan, also for, for you from Aura. Uh, she's asking, please further explain the way the policy instruments can be improved. Do you refer to the practical way the instrument can be improved, for example, by participating in certain internal processes, or does this question refer to the actual policy contents we're aiming to improve? Where well, Aura, this is actually defined in the program manual, the, the different categories that the, the program considered as, as policy improvements. But Hassan, I, I give you the floor so you can- Yes, yes, uh, thank you, Charo. I was, I was, I, I have the, the, the program manual here with me. And I was looking for the for the exact uh, section of the program manual where we define the type of improvements that you can do uh, that you can achieve in a policy instrument. I don't find it now, but I will um, I will I will do it later. But usually there are three types of improvements uh, that you need to select in the application form. The first one is that when thanks to the exchange of experience, you generate new projects. Uh, you learn how in another partner region they are financing uh, creative industries through a voucher. And then in your region, you open a call for proposals to finance uh, projects uh, related to creative industries. And for this, uh, you uh, allocate a specific amount of funding. So through new projects, you improve the way you uh, manage your policy instrument. Another type of improvement is what we call governance or the management of the policy instrument itself. Uh, thanks to what you learn from your uh, partners, you introduce a new selection criteria for your uh, call for proposals, or you uh, come up with a new set of indicators to monitor how the uh, program is being implemented in the region. 
or you create a new uh, governing structure for, for the uh, policy instrument. Uh, and finally, the last type, and you mentioned this in your question, is what, what we call a structural change. Because what, thanks to what you learn, you change the content of the policy instrument itself. You introduce a new priority, or you uh, introduce a new element, a new topic that was not uh, covered before uh, in the policy instrument. So this is very well defined in the program manual. And in the application form, we will ask you to explain what type of uh, improvement you plan to have in your policy instrument. Of course, the fact that you select only one doesn't mean that during the implementation of the project usually, and what we see uh, from our uh, project partners, they manage to achieve different types of changes through the lifetime of the project. So they might have an improvement in the sense of new projects, then they later on, they improve the governance. And in some cases, they even manage to change the content of the policy instrument itself. But I will check where it's uh, in the program manual. Uh, so I can give you exactly the, um, the reference of the don't don't worry, Hassan, because maybe Josephine can do it. Uh, she can post it in the chat, the the exact section where we mm. uh, describe this in the program manual. Federico says uh, page forty-seven forty-eight. Great. Let me confirm forty-seven forty-eight. So you see, it's very important that you print the program manual because all the answers to your questions are in the program manual. Even ourselves, we go to the program manual uh, very, very often and we wrote it ourselves, but uh, it's, uh, it's where you can find, uh, and it's very important that you familiarize with the structure and the content of the... Of the um... Well, yes. in order to yes. be sustainable... Thank you, you it's, it's true, it's, it's section 3.3.3. Uh, improving policies. And there you have the three types of change with an example for every change. And uh, we invite you to, to check the draft program manual to, to have more information about this. Yeah, I, I was just saying that they don't have necessarily to print it, but they have to have the, the program manual. They can have the, the digital version <laughs> and they can still have all the answers. Um, okay, so we have another question about pilot actions, Hassan, and although you already tackled some of these uh, points, uh, I wanted to raise this again because I think it's interesting that you explain that there are two different stages at which they can request pilot actions, not only at the application stage, because Beatriz is asking, a pilot must be carried out in the first three years of the project. Not necessarily, because they can also request it a bit later. Does it have to be a single pilot for the entire project? Do all the partners have to carry out the pilot? Or can there be several pilots and each partner make one? Some of these, as I said, you tackled it before, but maybe it's interesting that you explain the different stages at which they can request pilot actions. Um, yes, Beatriz, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, the first thing that I would like to say is that do not be obliged to uh, present a pilot action. If it's, if it's not clear for you what you are going to test, we are not going to score better an application because it uh, comes with pilot action than one that has no pilot actions. So keep it simple. If, if it's not clear for you that you are ready to test something that might clearly improve the policy instrument that you address, it's better that you don't do a pilot action. You will have the possibility later on in the project to request this pilot action because pilot actions are possible from the application stage. So if you request them now, or uh, when we you will be two years into the core phase, we will invite you to what we call a, a midterm review. And there we will discuss with you how this change of experience process has been going on. Have you discovered something that has been interesting for your region that you would like to test? And there we will open a call again. Of course, a restricted call for the, for the projects approved. And you will have the possibility to get uh, additional funding for a pilot action. Now, the limitation for pilot actions, regardless if you ask for it at the beginning of the project or at midterm, is that we will only finance one pilot action per policy instrument. So one pilot action per region 
during the lifetime of the project. You will not be able to test two pilots. It's only one. Now, can we have different pilots in the project? Yes, as long as they are developed jointly. So you need at least two countries involved in a pilot. One can be the donor of the knowledge that you want to test and the other one can be the testing region. And it might happen that in a project, uh, two partners would like to test this good practice. Another two partners would like to test this other good practice. But again, as I mentioned before, the more pilots you request, the more partners you involve, the more difficult it is to explain this clearly in the application form and to make sure that all the pilots comply with the criteria uh, that we request uh, for them to be eligible and approved. Interregionality, relevance, durability, everything is described in the program manual. Uh, I hope that this answers your question. So one pilot per policy instrument, only one throughout the lifetime of the project, at the beginning of the project or at midterm, so if for you it's not fully clear what you would like to test, wait. You will have later on the possibility to request a pilot action. And again, keep it simple. Uh, don't come with too many pilot actions that is not clear uh, what, uh, what uh, you are going to test, who is going to test what, where the knowledge comes from. Because for us, when we will assess the application, it will raise a lot of questions and this might be uh, negative in the assessment of the, of the different criteria uh, that we apply uh, in, during our assessment. Thank you, Hasson. We have now a question for Alexandra and uh, from Kat Katrin. Uh, and I think it's not that much about the uh, exact number of uh, reports, but about the fact if they have to have a final report after the regular reporting uh, or not. Um, there's no special kind of report at the end of the, uh, there's not going to be a, some kind of special kind of report at the end of the project. So. Um, the reporting will be based on six monthly reports. In each report, there will be um, reporting on activities, so content and financial reporting every six months. Um, so there's going to be in total eight reports. Uh, seven of them will cover six months uh, periods. Uh, and the final report, the only difference will be that it will cover also the closure period of three months. So it will cover uh, nine months. Yeah, and you will learn more about reporting, of course, uh, when your prog project is uh, approved and we will be organizing uh, lead partner uh, events to explain more about the reporting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. And we have another question from Anna. Now, Hasson, this is this one's for you on policy instruments. Uh, we also get this question quite often, but I think it's good that we remind them since we have a lot of newcomers today. Who is actually the the, the policy responsible uh, authority? Who is the policy owner? Is the one involved in the elaboration and implementation of the selected policy instrument? Yes, uh, usually, as I mentioned before, is usually a public authority. Uh, for example, you know that there is this eligibility criteria that at least one of the policy instruments addressing the project has to be an investment for jobs and goal uh, uh, for jobs and growth goal program. And for this, the policy responsible authority is the managing authority. You have a list of managing authorities for the operational programs in the program website. They are the ones responsible for the operational programs. And in this case, you can involve the managing authority as policy responsible authority or as associated policy authority. But if we are talking, for example, about a local mobility plan in a municipality, the responsible is, is the city, is the municipality of this plan. They are the ones designing and approving the plan and implementing the plan. But in some cases, as I was mentioning also before, parts of the implementation or the responsibility for certain elements of a program 
might not be in the municipality. Maybe the municipality has created a public company, a public transport company, that is the one that is responsible for the mobility of the citizens in the city. Can we be considered policy responsible authority? Maybe. Uh, if uh, what, what we say is that we don't know ourselves who can be considered policy responsible authority. And here the role to uh, certify if, if you are policy responsible authority or not is the national point of contact. So if you have any doubt, if this organization can be considered a policy responsible authority, you, we, we invite you to contact the national point of contact to check with them if this will be the case. They will be the ones to tell you, yes, this, uh, this is according to uh, national rules and according to the way we understand the program, can be considered a policy responsible authority. So in case of doubts, because we will see, for example, in the application form that a university uh, comes as policy responsible authority for a regional innovation strategy. For us, it will be a little bit uh, weird we don't say that this is not possible, uh, but we will check with the national point of contact. And then they will say, ah, yes, yes, because you know there is an agreement between the regions and the specific universities uh, to uh, be the ones that monitor the implementation of the strategy. And in this sense, they can be considered policy responsible authorities. But in, in, in general, 90% of the cases, the policy responsible authorities are public uh, bodies. Uh, so national ministries, regional governments, municipalities, this is the usually the core uh, group of policy responsible authorities, which does not mean, because we work with all the European Union, that in some cases, some specific organizations might be also considered uh, policy responsible authorities for a specific policy instruments. So in case of doubts, please check with your national point of contact because at the end of the day, it will be then, uh, it will be them who will uh, inform the program, yes, you can consider this organization as policy responsible authority uh, and we will uh, agree with, the, with it, of course. Yeah, I think that this is the most important message, Hassan, that they, in case of doubt, they should check with their national contact points, because actually, if we have doubts, we're going to check with them. So uh, to follow up on this, and very quickly, because you also mentioned that it's good uh, that we uh, emphasize it, Anna is also asking, can all partners involved in the consortium select the investment for jobs and growth uh, goal programs uh, from its region as a policy instrument in the project? Yes, of course, this is possible. Uh, investment for jobs and growth is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, a, is a policy instrument. The eligibility rule says that only one has to be a, an OP, an operational program. But if you have the managing authorities involved or uh, you are working, for example, on governance or a very specific theme or topic, that uh, the better way to address it is through the uh, investment for jobs and growth. All policy instruments can be operational programs. Yes. I think this also answers Vika's question. But uh, Vika, if uh, you have uh, any doubts related to this, or you want to uh, ask anything related to the uh, uh, investment for jobs uh, and growth uh, programs, please, please go ahead. Um, okay, and we have another question from uh, Stefano. Uh, he says, Horizon, uh, Horizon EU have calls involving Africa and EU for sustainability, for example, in agricultural sectors involving EU and Africa. Is it possible to activate joint exchange programs by inviting African actors, farmers, policymakers, schools, etc., to be trained on the theme of the agroecology in EU? I suppose in the framework of Interreg Europe, of course. Well, we are quite different from Horizon. Uh, the participation of uh, third countries uh, is possible, but with their own funding. And Stefano, what you need to keep in mind is that the program is about improving regional development policies in the European Union of the participating uh, countries. So a joint exchange program to invite African actors 
this would be more capacity building for these actors to go back to their countries and improve their policies, which is not fully in line with what the Interreg Europe program finances, which is capacity building among member states, European regions to improve regional development policies in Europe. Uh, so this type of arrangement, I would not see it uh, very relevant in the context of an Interreg Europe program uh, project. Um, following with the uh, policy instruments, uh, Andrea is asking if for an NGO participating as a partner, if they have to address a public policy instrument having to have on board the, the policy responsible authority, or if they can address an internal policy instrument being themselves the responsible authority. Um, yes, Andrea, this is also an interesting question, but an internal an internal policy instrument, for example, the strategy of the NGO for us is not considered a policy instrument. Again, this has to be a law, a program deriving from public intervention. So an internal document in the, in the framework of Interreg Europe cannot be considered a policy instrument. So you really need to look, you need to start from what is the issue that I want to address? Am I policy relevant? Meaning that uh, you, if you bring the policy responsible authority, then it's perfect. If not, you will really to demonstrate what is the role of this NGO in the policy making process related to this policy instrument. Uh, but it cannot be an internal document because you are not a public authority. Uh, you are an, uh, a private organization, not for profit, and your internal documents cannot be considered uh, policy instruments in, in our program. Thank you, Hasson. I have now a question for Alexandra, also coming from Catherine. Uh, she is asking, when I, what I understand it, she is asking if we can provide information uh, uh, from, by the national contact points on country specific, uh, on how the, the, the verification of expenditures is done at country level. Um, Alexandra? Can you provide by national contact points information? I suppose she wants to get more information or, or if or how on the on the verification okay. of expenditure at exactly. each country level. So um, information on that, uh, um, you can find information on that on our website in my country section. We are updating this information at, as it comes from uh, each national authority. So uh, it the information there might not be completely up to date. Uh, we are uh, still getting the information from them. Uh, so um, we, what we invite you to do is to uh, get in touch with your um, with your national authority if you uh, if you uh, if you're um, with your point of contact if you want to get some uh, information uh, if you mean uh, you are wondering whether you are supposed to budget the cost for the control uh, and you are not sure how it will uh, be done in the, this programming period and you were involved maybe in the last programming period and you are aware that for your country uh, um, the control uh, the, uh, was uh, was paying. You had to hire a controller yourself. Um, you have two choices: either you contact your uh, your authority and you ask the question directly, because for now uh, you um, we cannot confirm or deny it. Uh, most of them will be the same, but uh, we cannot be hundred percent sure. And the second option that you have is to simply budget the cost uh, if you are uh, if you are you know that this was the situation in the pre previous programming program uh, programming uh, period. Uh, if you don't budget these costs uh, and it turns out that the first level control, uh, which we will call now only control, will be paying. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, we will uh, change this. Uh, we can update uh, this uh, issue uh, during the fulfillment of condition uh, phase. Uh, and uh, you will be able to budget these costs for the partners who will need it in the end. 
Okay, thank you, Alexandra. Well, it's it's almost 11 and I suppose that some of you might need to leave. So uh, I think that we will stay a bit longer because we have still many questions uh, and, and keep receiving more, but we would like to launch uh, another poll uh, since, like I said, some of you might need to leave. Uh, and we would like to ask you for your feedback uh, on this Q&A session, if you find it useful, if you think this is going to help you prepare ap applications for this call, all the upcoming calls. We will leave this uh, poll open there for, for you to uh, keep uh, uh, sending your uh, answers uh, until the end of this session. But please, if you have to leave now, do so before you leave because your feedback is very uh, important for us. So uh, after this, I would like to continue with the questions. And I have here one for Hassan, which I think it's uh, interesting from Marta. Uh, she's asking, well, she's saying that they would like to target a policy instrument that is linked to React EU uh, ending in 2023, but the, with the government intention to continue working on it through the operational program until 2027. Can we link to this instrument ending in 2023 if there is a compromise to continue until 2027? Can we address this policy instrument, I suppose, that is ending in 2023 if there is this compromise to continue until the end of the programming period? I would say no. I need to focus in the... Hassan, Can you hear me? No, no, yes. <laughs> no, yes sorry. Uh, I would say no. No, it's not working. We cannot no. hear you. We don't know what's going on. Let me check because now, it seems to be fine. Yes. Now it's, now, now now it's, it's working. working. No? Yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, I would say uh, no. You cannot focus on a policy instrument that will finish when your project will start if it's approved. So my recommendation would be that you should focus in the new OP 2021-2027. Okay, um, thank you, Hassan. And this uh, is this is this is something that uh, this is something that we have also this question recurrently. You will go into the uh, information available in the program website about the investment for jobs and growth goal programs that are, and, and you will see that for some countries there are still the current operational programs because they are waiting uh, for an update once the commission will approve the new operational programs. So do not focus on the current OPs because most of them are, are finishing now and there will be no point in exchanging on how to improve something that will not be operational once the projects uh, will start. So focus on the next OPs, even if they are not approved yet, the important thing will be that you have a clear idea of the content and structure of the new OP to select which is the policy objective, the specific objective, the specific measure that you would like to tackle and improve thanks to the cooperation. Thank you, Hassan. Um, I see here a question from Guillermo, which I think was answered before, but uh, I would like just to say, Guillermo, you don't need to address uh, a job, uh, an investment for growth and jobs program uh, necessarily uh, uh, in the framework of the project. Uh, you just need to, uh, the, the requirement is that at least one of the policy instruments that you are addressing at program level is one of these programs, but not necessarily if that doesn't apply to your specific uh, territorial issue or challenge, you don't need to address one of these programs. You can address other strategies or instruments. I don't know, Hassan, if you want to add uh, something else. Uh, yes, and then, you know, the, the issue is that uh, how this issue address is reflected in the Investment for Jobs and Growth program. You are working with energy communities and mobility, then it's policy objective two, environment. What do you want to improve in your region? What type of organization you are working for? Are you relevant for the operational program or you are too far? from the OP, and as Charo was saying, it's better to focus on a more, uh, let's say, uh, on a policy instrument that is closer to your competence, so the local level or the regional level. So um, 
you need to, 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 to take all this into consideration. Why do I want to address the OP? Am I relevant for the OP? And uh, what is exactly the issue address? If I want to work in a mobility, what do I want to improve in the OP? Do I want the OP to open calls to uh, promote a certain type of immobility in the region? Uh, what is my role in all this process? This, these are all the questions that you need to ask yourself when selecting the policy instrument that you want to address in the project. Thank you, Hassan. We have also a question from Paola. She's asking how many proposals can an organization submit? Is it possible that the same university or organization submits a proposal as lead partner and another one as a partner? Uh, Paola, we would say focus on one, submit one proposal because we think that it's already complicated to prepare a good proposal to get the chances to get uh, approved by the program. So you should focus on one. Then legally, there is no limitation. What we check when we do the assessment, when there is multiple involvement, is, is the organization, uh, let's say, uh, um, has the financial means and the capacity to involve in more than one proposal. If you are a very, very small organization, maybe you don't have this capacity. If you come, if you are working for a big region and a big regional uh, uh, government, of course, uh, different departments, different units can be involved in different projects. But our recommendation is focus only on one, the one that is uh, that you have more chances to influence, that the policy instrument is more in line with what you want to improve. Uh, and this is, this is always our recommendation. But to the question itself, can we be involved in more than one? You can, yes. Thank you, Hasson. Um, Vika was asking if uh, there can be two pilot actions in one project. Uh, Vika, this was also answered before. Uh, yes, there can be, uh, of course, uh, keeping in mind all the uh, considerations and remarks that Hasson mentioned before, and that there is a limitation of only one pilot action per region involved. So if you requested a pilot action at the application stage and this was approved, you cannot do that uh, farther on uh, halfway through the project. Um, if you have additional questions about pilot actions, please uh, post them, or you can also uh, watch the recording of this Q&A session uh, uh, to, to see what we mentioned before about pilot actions. Okay, uh, now we have Katrin again asking if uh, where in the application form they need to provide the information on communication activities. In particular, she's mentioning the video and the two high level, uh, one plus two, I suppose it's uh, the video and the uh, communication events and the high level dissemination events. Only in part C or also in part E? I don't know who Hasson or Alexandra wants to take this question. Uh, I, I can start and then maybe Ola can complete. Um, in, the, the answer is in both parts because part C, you describe the communication strategy. What, what are your target groups? What are the tools that you are going to use? what is the content of your communication strategy? And in part E, which is the work plan, you need to explain how every semester you will implement your communication strategy. Um, so in, in both in both um, both parts, it will be important to tackle the, 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 the issues related to communication in the in the project. Yeah. Uh I don't know if there's anything to add from my side, maybe only uh, the um, information to when you are planning the costs for these activities to uh, to in, in section F then uh, to make sure that it is clear what you're planning them for. So uh, use the similar wording and similar if you name your event in a specific way, if you're planning the costs, uh, uh, make sure that we can link the cost that you are planning with the activities that you are describing in section C and E. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, we have this question also from Anna. Uh, if a public university can be an advisory partner? 
Yes. Uh, sorry, the other one. <laughs> ah, uh, yes, of course. Uh, in some cases, the role of the university will be to provide the knowledge or to help in the exchange of experience uh, process with a particular methodology, or uh, they are the ones uh, there to analyze the identification and, and analysis and transfer of good practices. Yes, we see uh, in particular the universities uh, as advisory partners in the in the context of Interreg Europe projects. And now, yes, uh, the question from Anna Sofia: uh, Are the two videos at the start and at the end of the project mandatory? Yes, they are. Then uh, this is the minimum uh, requirement to have two videos. It's defined in the program manual in section. Um, Three point no seven point one two project branding and visibility rules. There is this uh, paragraph on promotional material, and here it, they give you a little bit some tips on what these two videos should be about, and then of course uh, you are free to propose uh, additional videos if this is the case. But these two are uh, mandatory. Yes. And Anna Sofia has this question as well, Hassan, about the support letter from the stakeholders. Maybe it's good that you clarify that. Yes, uh, there are no, no support letters from the stakeholders. Uh, the support letter is something that was uh, used in the current program. It does not exist anymore. Now, uh, what we have is the declaration. The declaration combines uh, the commitment of the partner uh, for the co-financing and the involvement in the project activities. And on the uh, right column, there is the part for the associated policy authority where they uh, comply when they explain that they are the responsible authority for the policy instrument address and that they will be involved uh, in the project activities. For the stakeholders, you just need to provide, as Charo was saying, an indicative list of the organizations that you consider important for the exchange of experience uh, process, because it's, it's mandatory to create one stakeholder group per policy instrument, but there is nothing that you need to, uh, to upload from, from the stakeholders. Um, I have this question. I think it's interesting that Alexandra uh, tackles this during our session from Sandra. She's saying, what's the optimal date to start the activities of the project and the period of eligibility the expenditure starts this, if, if the period of eligibility starts with this date or when the proposal is approved? So it's about the eligibility of the expenditures of the project. Yes, so the eligibility of the expenditure starts um, on the date the our monitoring committee will approve the project. So this is where the um, eligibility period will start. You will still have to most probably uh, work on the conditions that we propose for your project, but this is where the eligibility period of expenditure uh, starts. Um, and the activities we always say to project to to project to start the activities as soon as they can, but within the eligibility period, the moment you start the if you start your activities before uh, um, the costs that you will be able to declare the pro to the program, uh, you will be able to declare only the costs that uh, and activities that you have done after the decision of the monitoring committee. Thank you, uh, Alexandra. We have this uh, question from Paola uh, about policy instruments. Again, Hassan, is, I think it's interesting. Uh, in Italy, the managing authority of the uh, ERDF, the, the, the operational program must develop territorial strategies for the implementation of policy objective five. These strategies are drawn up with the involved municipalities which are responsible for the implementation of the interventions. Can these municipalities be considered as policy responsible authority? It's a, it's a very interesting question, Paola. I, I, I would not be able to give you an answer. In principle, I would say no. Uh, the, the policy responsible authority is the managing authority for the OP. It's true that you are working on policy objective five. So these are territorial, uh, integrated territorial uh, initiatives. Uh, it's multi-level, uh, multi-sectoral. 
uh, and then it will be up to Italian national point of contact to 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 say if if, if for a specific case and in a specific topic, uh, one municipality can be considered policy responsible authority. But uh, to be to be taken with care, meaning that uh, for me, in principle, it should be the managing authority, the one considered as policy responsible authority. Then uh, Italy national point of contact will be the 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 the, the will be the ones that uh, can be more accurate and more precise in 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 providing an answer. But. Um, my my feeling is that uh, we could not uh, consider the, these municipalities as policy responsible authorities for the operational program. Uh, thank you, Hassan. Follow, following up on this a little bit, uh, and this will be the the last question that we are taking today. We are very sorry we cannot. We have a few more that we we are not able to to answer uh, in the session of today because we are already. 15 minutes late and uh, we have to close this session. But I would like to remind you once again that we will have another session in two weeks and we will keep these questions or we will send you the answers. Don't worry about that. But this is the last question that we are going to take live today. And it's also for you, Hassan uh, from Pristina. Can a regional smart specialization strategy be considered as a policy instrument? Yes. Of course, the regional innovation strategy is a policy instrument of the region at regional level. What it cannot be considered, and this is also a recurring question, is an investment for jobs and goal uh, program. Even though the smart specialization strategy is an ex-ante condition, is closely linked to the operational program, it's not considered an investment for, job, uh, for jobs and growth, but is uh, definitely a policy instrument that can be addressed uh, uh, by the by the regional partners in in a, in an interreg europe uh, project thank you hassan and uh, with this we are going to uh, close this round of questions and answers uh, but before we close this session, we would like to um, uh, go through uh, a few reminders before you leave us. First of all, we've been sharing with you a lot of interesting uh, links in the chat throughout the session. Please check these links. Uh, they are referring to the things that were mentioned before uh, by Hassan and Alexandra, and also general information that can be helpful for you at program level if you're preparing your applications or you're planning to apply to these or the upcoming calls but also we wanted to remind you of the tools that we have available for you uh, in our website again to prepare your applications for these or the upcoming calls if you are still wondering if Interreg Europe is for you if your proposal your project idea fits in the uh, program rationale uh, you can check the, the relevance of your idea uh, using the tool in our website, check your project relevance. It's kind of a self-assessment assessment tool. It's quite easy. It's just like a test. You click the, the answers and you will have, uh, you will see if your idea is relevant. You can also get inspired if you don't know yet exactly what to do. Uh, you can get inspired by other project ideas that were already uh, either uh, supported by the program or that are other uh, applicants uh, planning to uh, submit and the first call of proposals that we are launching that we launch and we are closing by, at the end of May. You can also share your project idea. If you're still looking for partners, you can also do so through our website. You share your project idea, you indicate the type of partners that you're looking for, the geographical areas, and you can use this tool also to complete your, your consortium, your partnership. And of course, if you have a developed idea already, you have a, a partnership, you know what you want to do, you have your policy instrument selected, let's say a more developed uh, description of your idea, you can ask for feedback with us in reason or uh, via video conference, we can have a conversation about your idea. And we can give you a few tips and feedback uh, to prepare your application um, 
for this call. And of course, we remind you, like I said before, that we launched the call and it's going to be open until the end of May. It will close this 31st of May and you can submit your applications until then, if I remember correctly, is uh, noon uh, CST, right? Okay. Uh, don't want to. And uh, you have all these tools uh, in our website. Like I said, you can always uh, contact us if you have the questions. Our contacts are in the website. Uh, not only the colleagues that uh, work here today, but uh, the rest of our policy and finance officers. So please do so if you have uh, all the questions. Like I said, they will have a last chance for you to submit your questions and get them answered live in two weeks, the 20th of May. That will be our last Q&A session. We invite you to join and to post your questions if you still have more or if we couldn't answer your question today. And as a last reminder, please uh, go check the recordings uh, of these and the previous Q&A sessions and also the lead applicant webinar that happened, uh, if I remember correctly, end of April. Uh, you can check there the, the videos and also the, the question and answers that we had live during these events on partnership, methodology, finances and communication. If you are planning on applying, it's interesting that you watch the recordings because this will be very helpful for you. And this brings us to the end of this session. Thank you very much for uh, uh, being with us if you're still here until the end of this session. We hope that this has been helpful for you and uh, we hope to see you there when the uh, call closes with your application and uh, we wish you uh, the best of luck and a, a lot of success. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you so much. Bye.